happening to everybody. Yeah, maybe while we wait for Peter, probably the good thing, the best thing would be for us to introduce ourselves. Great idea. Yeah. Yeah. Arjun, why don't you kick it off? Yeah. Sorry? Sorry. I, I'll go. Why don't you go ahead, Naratha, and if it's enough, and then we'll go around yeah, the room yeah. and while we wait. Yeah, hi. Hi, everybody. I'm the founder of ThinkNath Consulting. I happen to be into the space of brand communication, creation, reinvention. I also happen to be India's top three marketer under 30 three times in a row. And I worked in different portfolios from FMCG to FNB to real estate to social impact. I can see Peter is there. Peter, can you speak now? More of the same, I think. Hi. Um, okay, go on. In which case, Subit, maybe uh, over to you and then... Uh, we, we, why don't we let the ladies go first? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. So uh, I'm Dionysia. I'm a member of the Greek Parliament and chair of the Environment Committee of the Parliament. Uh, I'm working on issues on uh, environment, sustainability, energy for many years in uh, many different uh, capacities. I'm, for example, the director of the European Institute of Law, Science and Technology, where we try to make good use of um, high technology in many spheres, including, of course, environment and energy, but also biogenetics, space, information technology, etc., in order to promote societal goals. And I've been uh, in the uh, leadership of important global organizations, such as I've served as the vice chair of the Global Water Partnership Organization in Stockholm. Uh, in, on these capacities, I had the opportunity to work with many people that relate to India and to have the opportunity to enjoy and to learn about the very big possibilities and capacities of Indian people and how they can contribute on the global sphere. And I'm very happy to discuss about that in our session today. Peter, are you there? Okay. Yeah, I can't. I don't think you can hear me. We can. We can hear you. Oh, you can hear me. Yeah. Great. So well, let's keep going. Thank you very much indeed. My apologies for the slight challenge. Uh, we'll keep going like this. Um, I've understood that uh, Dr. Avagana Pulu has introduced herself. And um, have any of the other ladies introduced themselves? Both the ladies have. Thank you. Let's move on now to um, Adrian, Adrian Mutton. Uh, you're at you're a very unearthly time there in Washington. Perhaps you can say a few words about yourself, Adrian. Yeah, good morning, good afternoon from Washington, D.C. Uh, so I'm the founder and chief executive of SunMS4. Uh, we're a business which I established in India 12 years ago to help uh, international investors, uh, educators and non-profits enter and expand in the India market. I've lived in India for a total of uh, 11 years myself. Uh, my three children were born on the ground there. I sit on the CII um, MSME um, Trade Export uh, Working Group, which reports into the Ministry of MSME, looking at helping boost India's micro, small and medium-sized enterprise export. And I'm delighted to join us. I moved from Washington, D.C., from New Delhi. So very pleased to be here. Good morning. Welcome, Adrian, and thank you for your flexibility uh, at this um, early time in the morning there. Uh, we also have uh, Mr. Sumit Anand. Um, welcome, Sumit. Uh, would you like to say a few words about yourself? Thanks, Peter. Yeah, sure. So um, uh, I'm the founder of a strategy consulting firm called Inside Growth Partners. Uh, we advise international clients on India's strategy. Uh, I set that up after about 15 years as uh, in a corporate career with French and European multinationals as country manager. Uh, I'm also the president of the indo in bilateral chambers. Uh, I'm very happy to be here and hope to contribute to the conversation. Thank you very much indeed, Sumit. Uh, and finally, Arjun Malik, um, you're based in another continent, Africa. Welcome, Arjun. Would you like to say a few words about yourself? Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Arjun. I am uh, Managing Director for uh, Prudential's Businesses in East Africa. I also happen to sit on their global sort of executive. Um, I am very delighted to be here and look forward to this conversation. Thank you very much indeed, Arjun. 
And finally, I'm uh, Professor Peter Perret. I'm in Switzerland. Uh, we finished the lockdown, so I'm in my office here. Uh, I'm at a university called the University of Applied Sciences in northwestern Switzerland, which is around the sort of Basel, Zurich area, um, focused on pharmaceuticals, med tech, and that sort of um, sector. Uh, we have a lot of app contact with India, with different projects, with our students, and also with research. So I'd like to start off the session by just giving a brief intro. I listened to a few of the other sessions, um, particularly with the railways minister. That was fascinating. Um, and there's a lot of activity going on in the environmental space. And I'd like to draw on, first of all, uh, Dr. Avagana Pulu, who um, adds a, a special dimension to this discussion, because um, we've noticed since the COVID pand pandemic um, that India has actually certainly um, benefited from cleaner air. So, for example, in Delhi, um, there's certain, the, the skies are blue again, the rivers are clear. Um, and at the end of April, I looked at the st statistics, 88 cities in India recorded cleaner air. And I'd like to um, start off the question, we're actually focused on what constraints might be relieved by the Indian government. But I think it's got a very, very clear environmental impact here because um, Dr. Avangana Kapula, as she said, she's very focused on inter international collaboration, this environmental se sector. Um, she's also, as she said, uh, she's a member of the Hellenic Parliament and also she was awarded, she's a recipient of the Green Star by the United Nations Environmental Programme. So I'd like to ask you um, the first question, Dr. Avangana Kapula, what um, constraints might be relieved by the Indian government? This is really our main thrust. Um, and as we grapple with solving this crisis, what kind of synergies do we see with the environment? I think there are strong links here. Perhaps you could um, bring that into it. Over to you. Uh, we unmute, uh, Dionysia. Ah, you're unmute. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no I set my microphone to mute in order not to uh, like create any uh, voices back uh, in the background, but now I'm back again. So uh, what happened over the last month is that uh, globally, the global community saw that it is possible to make a difference if we all, we all change our lifestyles. Because of the lockdown measures that many countries actually adopted, uh, the people stayed at their places, they worked uh, from home, they exercised homeschooling, and even they socialized through the internet, uh, rather by being together. So the transportation was really limited, and in general, even factories and other places like restaurants uh, and um, like schools, other uh, buildings uh, that they used to um, have a lot of CO2 emissions, they stopped or they eliminated their use, their function. As a result, uh, many of the chemicals uh, and other emissions that used to uh, pollute the atmosphere, they went rapidly down. And we had the opportunity to breathe cleaner air and also see, as you mentioned, monuments. Uh, like uh, from Athens, we were able to view the Acropolis here so clear as ever before. But of course, like this clean air uh, actually stopped as soon as the lockdown measures stopped. So what should we um, suppose uh, to um, do this, to have lockdown measures all the time? This is impossible. And this is something that we cannot waste. What we can learn out of this experience is that we could change a little bit our life. For example, we should, if it is possible, stay at home at least one or two days per week and work from home. It is not important to travel if we can do our work otherwise. For example, I think that many of us, we take a lot of international travel. I used to travel before the pandemic at least once or twice per month uh, internationally. Now, with uh, our co-workers, we're able to 
uh, work better through these type of virtual meetings and we can work effectively. So people understood that by making some type of change in their lifestyle, we can really make a change globally. Of course, uh, from a government point of view, we need to promote into digitalization of our economy. For example, the government should be uh, should be able to provide more internet services to the citizens, and also the businesses should uh, be helped to evolve their uh, governance in order to support uh, teleworking. And the Ministry of Education should be able to adapt more homeschooling programs. India is actually a leader in ICT, in um, information, telecommunications, uh, and also in the artificial intelligence field. The Indian universities and Indian businesses could work and should work together with other, other businesses and universities all over the world in order to create a more effective, uh, more pleasant digital world. Because we need this digital world in order to save the natural world. And because I would like not to spend all the time and give time to the other participants to speak, I would like to say well, in advance, and I could elaborate on this uh, later, that what we learned after this COVID-19 experience is that we should for sure elevate on our chain, on our pyramid of values, environmental protection and public health at the same level with the economic development. This has been now accepted by the majority of people worldwide. We have to work on sustainable development and incorporate the, the public health issues very strongly in this concept of development. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, can you still hear me? Yeah, we can. Great. Um, a little bit intense. But thank you very much indeed for, for that focus on, on the environment. And I think you mentioned ICT and tech solutions, and, and it does link in very well with entrepreneurship here. Uh, India has is, is got a very uh, strong hand in all those areas. We know uh, about its strength in entrepreneurship and ICT and services. Um, maybe I could ask uh, Anurata, you're, you're actually, you know, you've been voted um, one of the top entrepreneurs um, in your field in communication and marketing. Would you like to also comment on that, you know, bringing maybe uh, your field of entrepreneurship into it, uh, but staying with the question of what constraints might be relieved by the Indian government. If we're moving into now more smaller enterprises, entrepreneurship, but it's, relinked, it's directly related to what Dr. Andrew mentioned about the environment. Definitely. Thanks, Peter. I think uh, India recently announced the relief package. And, uh, you know, uh, it amounted to 10% of India's GDP. So percentage wise, it was very good because considering it matched to you know, the US GDP. However, economy was already very vulnerable before COVID-19. And, you know, considering MSMEs have lower levels of resilience and vulnerability, uh, the relief package failed to provide, you know, uh, the, the so-called relief and it only provided liquidity. So I think what needs to be really looked at, considering as MSMEs contribute to almost 37% uh, of India's GDP is uh, that the ease of doing business needs to be further increased. In 2019, India went up by 14 places when it came to ease of doing business. However, considering if you're the fifth largest economy in the world, 63rd place is not the place to be in. Uh, also, I, I, I strongly believe uh, the, the, the battle that we are fighting right now, it, it is not a life versus livelihood. It is life versus life. If the economy fails, the pandemic is going to take a toll, which is, which is as worse as the health crisis that we are facing. Uh, when I talk about, uh, you know, the ease of doing business, it is not only about, you know, a lot of tech startups wanting to ship their base out of the country, but it is also about uh, drawing investment into the country. I feel red tapism needs to be replaced with red carpet. Like, you know, we need to have, you know, the reform policies which are talking, you know, which are helping the SMEs, you know, with the daily business. Uh, I, uh, another thing that I would like to talk about is the very high corporate tax in the country. 
uh, we have seen the likes of flipkart and the grofers you know shifting their base out of the country and you know going to singapore let's say and um, the singapore uh, tax rate remains at 17% however you know the india corporate tax rate is very very high considering that we are one of the largest startup ecosystem uh, i think that is something uh, that that really really needs to be reflected upon thank you very much indeed anuraba um we're now we're moving into the sort of realm of um startups and sme smes um adrian your you mentioned your um a member of the confederation of india indian industry the msme council um would you like to expand on some of those points that anuraba mentioned and also perhaps uh highlight some of your activities and and kind of um uh, tips and recommendations about drawing investment into the country please thank you peter uh, i think what india has been able to achieve in the last uh 10 years particularly is a an entrepreneurial spirit which has become increasingly global so india has always had the jugaad spirit which is a very domestic way of making things happen but clearly through the evolution of many of of the world's leading tech businesses and the role that indian entrepreneurs and graduates have had in those companies you can see the true potential that india has we've talked often over the last few years about india's demographic dividend its human capital base which i still feel is india's greatest asset and that is the sense of um energy and economic output that can come through this enormous and frankly unparalleled historically rise of young bright ambitious uh indian citizens and what we're trying to do on the msme council is to harness that energy harness that appetite for entrepreneurialism not just in india but for those individuals to be given a global opportunity and as anarada suggests when the framework for scaling a business when the ability to raise capital in america or singapore or london when the tax rates are um become disincentives to scale a business or to exit a business which increasingly young entrepreneurs are looking at what their uh, return on investment is as they exit and india still has a fairly aggressive uh, short term capital gains tax regime which means that new staff and entrepreneurs that are brought into a business struggle when you put those um ingredients together the recipe for um uh, for success of a young scaling entrepreneur are are significantly disadvantaged as compared to other countries and i think what you're seeing in in um in india's case is many of its brightest um businesses are starting to get to a particular scale uh but then they're looking overseas for capital which may be more advantageous for them or they're looking at overseas footprints to be able to scale up and i think what we've got to try to do and we're working on this at the MSME council is to encourage a framework that enables them and, and encourages them to stay in india but also attracts global talent to india no country has succeeded in really accelerating its agenda by being isolated even china's rise in in the global economy has been on the back of its integration into the us economy particularly by bringing us expertise there and so india l- needs to look at a way of encouraging foreign entrepreneurs foreign investors into the country to to create what would then be i believe a a, a globally um leading uh, and most compelling um proposition for for young and bright not just indian entrepreneurs but global entrepreneurs thank you adrian and um that brings in the whole kind of topic of collaboration at a global level um attracting investment into india i think summit um you know you've got excellent expertise in the area of um french uh, indo french collaboration in the through your chamber of commerce experience would you like to 
also maybe expand a little bit on some of those points you know we all sort of collaboration um not only within the country um vertical collaboration but global collaboration sure peter i'd love to do that uh, in my view uh, if india has to contribute to to relieve the global constraints uh, there are two roles that it has to play uh, one it has to really become a supply chain partner to the world and the other it needs to become an enhanced tech partner if i just take the first one you know in india we've been uh, fortunate enough to attract a lot of foreign direct investment over the last two and a half decades and it's been growing at 50% and in a five year cycle but the fact is we are obsessed in india of talking about the large groups that invest in india uh and the you know uh, and even in terms of uh, uh you know so whether it's the ge's or the coca colas of the world the reality is if you look at fdi into china uh there are 200000 foreign registered companies in china right and they added 30000 last year in 2019 in india these statistics are not even easily available uh, i could try i tried digging out some and i found some statistic that pointed to 100 that came in last year so 100 that came in last year new foreign registrations versus 30000 in china so these are not coming from large companies let's be clear if you look at the french ecosystem out of the top 40 cac 40 french groups 39 are already here if you look at the top 120 sbf index 100 are already here so unless we don't get the mid size companies maybe not the asset the small because india is complex i don't think we can really become a partner in the supply chain of the world and i think for that the government of india has to change its policy it has to uh, adopt a, a framework to support these mid size companies uh, something i could call you know a triple a framework right where it's not only about attracting them which is what we are very good at you know indian government and prime minister goes out and we market ourselves but also to assist and also to help them achieve um and i sense if we do that uh if we provide that focus you know the indian government has shown its capacity whether it's with the ease of doing business to put in solutions for that i'll give an example um, there's a lot of talk recently in india about uh you know land uh, reform certain state governments have started saying well uh, you know we can give you land we have a lot of land the fact is if you're a mid sized company you don't want to lock up your capital in in land and you don't want to lock up time to build out a factory for one or two years the reason why like china was able to attract so many mid sized companies and so is vietnam is that they have industrial parks that ready to rent factories that you can come in and you can deploy your capital really in what you know and what you uh, can execute quickly uh, so you know i think it it requires a, a different approach i think it's not been a priority for the moment for the indian government if they did that we could then truly become uh, a partner uh, in in as a global supply chain partner uh and therefore i would say the focus should be on mid sized companies and attracting international mid sized companies to india so that's one point maybe i can come back to my my uh, my second point on tech a little later since i've already yeah. yeah yeah absolutely i think we've got quite a bit to pick up on tech and particularly automotive the industry there um we can come back to that but i'd like to move on to arjun uh, before i do um i'd like to encourage people in the um audience here the participants not as participants in the in the discussion but also in the audience to actually write questions using the chat um so oh, ajon uh, ajon just um you you're involved in the uh, financial services sector um as a, as the managing director of east africa prudential africa there um and that is a, in itself um a very dynamic sector uh, finance and um there are constraints um there as well and um you know without going to great detail how do you see this question of uh, relieving constraints and 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 what is relevant to your sector financial services thank you peter and one of the themes that of this conversation that i've picked up uh, from the from the panel is the, the entire conversation is around opportunity and it so happens that the opportunity is coming to the forefront now um with the pandemic and the shift it's generated in the way we work one of the most obvious opportunity i can see in financial services india happens to have one of the most heavily regulated financial services sectors uh well why what 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 a pandemic like this would do and it's doing in other markets that i'm sort of involved with is allowing uh, a principal or or business open the conversation but celebrate and leap through some of the policy journeys that they had already envisaged but it's there on things like 
sort of non-face-to-face -face selling, for instance, or uh, accelerating access for uh, innovative startups, innovative fintech. I see, and I've seen in other places I've said, to have a word with the regulators and convince them that now is the time to accelerate uh, yeah. Um Some of the born in Western Cap uh, have been relaxed and plan for further relaxation during the next decade or so. Um, but I, I guess the broader question and, and, and uh, and the rest of the panel have, probably has more insight on this than I do, but how do we calibrate uh, regulation uh, with innovative disruption brought through by uh, fintech so that we can achieve access to the base of the pyramid? India is still heavily under benefit um, of all retail private sector credit, for instance, from uh, in rural India, only 2% of it comes from the private bank, for example. So um, uh, my, my submission, I suspect, is if, if there are any uh, politicians listening, uh, for them to consider this an opportunity to initiate conversations or listen to their stakeholders um, with regards to like peer-to-peer -peer transactions, uh, with regards to crowdfunding, um, and use this opportunity to accelerate um, to the unbanked and unserviced financial. Thank you. Um, I had a bit of a dodgy line there, but I hope I managed to pick up most of it. Um, maybe we could explore that kind of area of, of technology. Um, and maybe you'd like to pick up on that, Dr. Uh, Avogadopoulou. Um, you're um, also suggesting in your opening statement that um, there could be a lot to do with technology um, and the fact that people could travel less and we've got a very, very competent, very, very dynamic ICT sector in India. In India. Um, there's also the automotive uh, sector, which um, is also um, going over to electric cars. I mean, there's a lot of good things going on there. Would you like to pick up on, on the tech side of things here? Yes, um, yes, and thank you very much for asking me. So, uh, and I will pick up from what you said about electric cars. Actually, yeah. I can tell you that last year you know, in Greece, in the most important um, international expo of Greece, the Saloniki, uh, India was uh, the uh, guest country, the country of honor. And we had the uh, opportunity to see a lot of innovation that Indian entrepreneurs are undertaking among them the issues with the electric cars. Uh, India is known for producing low cost electric cars. And now Greece is uh, actually in the middle of the transition to the electric mobility model. So we need thousands, not to mention millions, of new electric cars that are affordable for the middle Greek. And this is happening to other countries as well. So I can see a great opportunity for India to provide to the rest of the world affordable technology, especially when it comes to energy transition. Cars is one example, but it could be other products as well. For example, batteries, like for energy storage and other alternative resources of energy. Uh, the universities and the uh, companies of India, they are excelling in these fields. And if they keep excelling, I think that they are going to be able to supply the rest of the world with these affordable, high technology innovations that we all need in order to uh, achieve the transition to the zero carbon economy that we all need in order to cope with climate change. But this is a very important sector. And another sector that I find that is very important uh, for um, Indian researching uh, is actually the water sector. Water, clean, quality water, potable water, and water for other uses is a challenge for India and the rest of the world. I know a lot of young entrepreneurs that are working on a pivotal on innovation regarding the pollution of wastewater. And I'm amazed by the innovations that they have come up. Some of these innovations, they don't only use high technology, but also um, 
plants from India. The biodiversity of the Indian region is very important as well in order to provide solutions for environmental problems. So I'm not sure why the rest of the world is not using this indigenous knowledge and the innovation in the universities of India. I think that India should come out aggressively as a leader in this type of innovations. So India can provide solutions for itself because water is a big issue in India as well and for the rest of the world. The same could hold true for the agribusiness as well, because malnutrition is an issue in India and in many other countries, and innovation, technology, and indigenous knowledge could help also us to address this very important issue of nutrition as well. But the, another point, because I don't know if uh, I'm going to have the chance to address you again, because we're running out of time, I would like to come back to the supply chain management on two different grounds. First, because India is a leader, as we said, in ICT, India could be leading the world on logistics, and logistics plays a very important role. I will give you just an example. You know that Greece is really leading in the shipping field. We have many, many ship owners, and our fleet is really a heavy fleet. So logistics and ICT is very pivotal on how to manage shipping all over the world. So I could see India playing a very important role in transportation, in global transportation through logistics and supply chain management. And last but not least, what I was really impressed through this COVID-19 crisis is that India was able to provide to the rest of the world health supplies and medical equipment. When we needed facial masks, then India was one of the countries that were able to send to us facial masks. And I know from our friends in India that India was able to produce facial masks in many in large numbers. So this sector of medical equipment and hygienic services could be also one very important sector that India could take the lead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Abrano-Kabubu. Um, I'd like to um, maybe just summarise that. There are a number of important points there. That sort of green, non-green distinction, should that be dis differentiated in any kind of relief, for example, um, particularly focused on electric cars? Maybe somebody could pick up on that. But I think this question of water is something that you and Arada uh, have, be, has, have been involved in, particularly through a project and uh, maybe you'd like to expand a little bit on water um, but also logistics we've heard is is crucial and finally that sort of distribution of health health equipment which even developing countries had challenges with but maybe we could you could pick up on water and around that. Definitely. Thank you, Peter, for that question. I, I'm so glad that she talked about safe drinking water because I am deeply and passionately involved with the project in India, which is called Janajal. So uh, during the whole COVID-19 situation, we have accelerated our technology innovation and considering that, you know, everything has to be contactless. That's the new order of the day. So, but, you know, our whole thing was to have contactless delivery of uh, water, of safe drinking water through the water ATMs that had been installed all over the country. So having said that, I also feel India has a lot of potential when it comes to the AI technology. Uh, however, the AI technology can only accelerate when there's enough data to look at. Uh, when we look at you know companies like Google or Facebook, uh, uh, most of the Android uh, user base is from India, and which also really spurs Google to you know uh, to try and to accelerate their AI innovation. I uh, I also feel the AI innovation in context of India, it has to be very, very customized and specific. Uh, one of our union ministers, uh, uh, Nitin Gadkari, recently said that we will not allow driverless cars to, you know, pile in India. So everything has to be, you know, uh, you know, in the Indian context. Also, I think government really needs to help when it, uh, you know, comes to dissemination of uh, data, because data is what the AI gets based on. So and uh, secondly, I also feel I might be, you know, digressing a little bit from tech here. I also feel, uh, you know, Indian women really needs to be encouraged when it comes to tech or when it comes to contributing to GDP. Right now, only 18 percent, you know, the contribution of Indian women to GDP is about just 18 percent. And there's a lot of potential there. Thank you. Um, so. 
I'd like now to sort of move forward dynamically. Would anybody like to comment on any of those po points? Um, you know, AI technologies, um, you know, the fact that water is crucial, you know, that safe drinking water and projects like Janajal um, we've heard about. Adrian, would you like to, uh, and maybe also in the context of um, SMEs, MSMEs, and also entrepreneurship. Adrian, any, any comments there? Yeah, I will say that uh, a lot of the work that we're doing at, uh, at SunMS4 and we're looking at with the government, with MHRD, uh, Ministry for Human Resources and Development, is around providing sandboxes for um, innovative tech and more broadly business development in general. And uh, India's ability to launch a entrepreneurial business um, in its early stages is, is, is a really challenging environment. I know because I've set, I've set several business up as a young entrepreneur in India and, uh, and, and scaled those up to a certain extent. Um, I feel that, um, where India can, can leverage its human capital advantage is through the university systems. The IITs are increasingly, um, referred to, they've become um, globally recognized, but they are the very top of the iceberg in India. And I think if we can use what is a forthcoming national education policy and an overhaul of the, um, the regulatory environment around universities, I think actually providing the right type of sandbox for young people to get used to uh, innovation, to entrepreneurship, uh, access to funding through the university system, I think is a really big opportunity for India to, to move the dial considerably because you've then got structured framework, structured environments from which um, unstructured innovation and entrepreneurship can happen. Thank you. So collaboration in research, um, re really encouraging a sandbox environment, maybe relaxing regulations. Uh, to a certain extent, particularly maybe in the, the fintech area that we were talking about, Arjun. Um, Anand, would you like to pick up on any of those points? Sure. You know, um, <clears throat> I think we talked about how uh, India can be uh, also the tech partner to the world. If you go look back at the Indian tech industry, it started off as a services industry and yeah. it's actually scaled up pretty well into engineering services, into uh, AI now and and increasingly, though still very small in the space of hardware, uh, I think uh, China took uh, you know a big lead in these areas with the AI and machine learning and built off on their R and D and manufacturing capabilities, uh, and they benefited from a 25-year run where they had a cooperation with a lot of countries and universities of the world. To go back to the point of universities. I think today, but the pre-COVID and especially post-COVID, one gets the sense that the West. Uh, in a broad way from North America to Europe, including perhaps in Israel and other such countries, which are tech countries, uh, would like to contain China and not necessarily look to cooperate as much with China as they've done in the past. Now, that's an opportunity for India. Uh, clearly, here we are not up against uh, Malaysia or Vietnam. Uh, here we already have a great uh, legacy of entrepreneurs, of talent, of international business. Uh, and what we really need in that sense is for the government of India to, you know, to what I would say, do a digital India bridge, which is what we've been talking about in partnerships, collaborations. The focus of digital India for the moment has been on Indian entrepreneurship. But I think what we need to do is have an approach to bridge the India, digital India with international startups, ecosystems, with international universities to encourage uh, that transfer of uh, and collaboration and partnership to happen. I think if the government did that, I think India could become also an important tech partner to the world. Excellent. Thank you so much. Sorry, I called you by the center. Um, that's excellent because uh, Switzerland, of course, yeah, we've got a few minutes left. Um, I can see a couple of questions in the chat. Um, Switzerland is, all, of course, very active um, in collaborating with tech, high tech, and um, I understand many countries are as well. Uh, Arjun, would you like to round up um, maybe with a few comments on, on your sector and the tech part, particularly uh, focusing on this digital bridge. Ark, you are mute. <laughs> You'd think uh, two months of each uh, meet to unmute every time I want to I just wanted to, just wanted to um, something that I know uh, we talked about is idea sharing and I'll reach out to you in terms of um, 
building the tech ecosystem, the first thing obviously would be uh, an important aspect would be to make sure that that's inclusive uh, as well and that rural women in the country have access to uh, participate in, in this revolution. Otherwise, we just create this wide gap uh, which we have created in, in other aspects of, of, of our society. And, and one of the uh, sort of charities that I'm on, on the board of, and I'll write to you guys about this, is an interesting idea, which is teaching coding uh, uh, to, to young men who usually uh, get left out because it's a male-dominated uh, space. So they don't sometimes feel they have the confidence needed. And in a world where uh, freelance gigging work uh, across the uh, planet, at least from the big uh, uh, is is spreading to um, uh, be able to be done anywhere, uh, and in the environment of work from home, this is an interesting sort of idea which we should consider. And, and I'll reach out to you guys and let you know uh, if we can do something about that. But yeah, that's uh, that's the only submission I had, Peter. Thank you very much indeed, Arjun. So I'd like to summarize this uh, exciting session. Um, first of all, to thank all the experts. I mean, it was a fascinating discussion. We've got so much expertise here from many countries, um, but we touched on a l number of opportunities. We didn't really focus on um, so much the negative parts, but more the opportunities. We heard many of those opportunities mentioned that are really going for India. So the high, the tech area, um, the, act, the activities going on in fintech, the activities going on in digital India. But the key point we also mentioned was collaboration, and not only collaboration within, within the country, but also collaboration um, across borders, global collaboration. And it's very important that we did stress that. Collaboration all mean, also means uh, encouraging and embracing female entrepreneurs. And it's very good to have uh, two of those here, but if I can include you, Doctor. Um, so thank you very much indeed for your contributions. I think we've got a lot more to see. Uh, we've learned a lot and Digital India and the experiences of COVID um, still are ongoing. And we're looking forward to collaborating together with you all in the future. So thank you very much indeed and enjoy the rest of the day's conference. Uh, it's a, been a wonderful experience for me to chair this session uh, and thank you for your expert contributions. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Thank you, Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you Adrian. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Okay.